like to start with this image that we have on the screen now. This is a, a representation, perhaps, of the future of coffee. And here we have, obviously, somebody who's starting out their life, both the plant and the girl. This is Marianita, and she's holding up a plant that she hopes to will one day produce coffee for her family, and potentially for her and perhaps her children. And when we begin to look at these kind of issues from a human perspective, we begin to realize that we're talking about processes that are going to take decades to reach fruition. And we're talking about not only the changes that Marianita as a child will go through, but the changes that the plant she's holding in her hands will go through. And we, both of these are definitely what we would call a long play. And if we look at the issue of climate change, climate change, as Aaron has, has presented in his talk, is also something that's happening over a decade or more of time. So the question is, how can we begin to combine not only resilience to climate change, but also livelihoods that support that resilience around the continued cultivation of coffee? And this is obviously an issue that is critically important to all of us who are here in the room today because our own livelihoods, to some extent, to a greater or lesser degree, depend on this. You know, we can talk about mapping, and I think Aaron laid out some very interesting information about Ethiopia in particular. And we could begin to look at where coffee is grown globally and where coffee is going to be grown in the future. These are some global maps from my colleague Christian Bunn's PhD thesis. And I think the important thing here is to say, well, this is where we are now, and this is more or less where we're headed by 2050, and if we want to put it into a bit more stark figures, we can talk about this kind of a map where we can show then the, the darker zones, positive change. And there are areas, as Aaron mentioned, that will come online, if you will, for coffee production. But there are a lot of areas that are going to sit, face significant challenges and will probably not be able to remain as coffee production zones into 2050 and beyond. So the important thing is to understand what we do with this information. So as we've mentioned, I think, earlier today, uh, there are different approaches to mapping and different approaches to modeling what's going to happen. What I want to share with you here are those same results we just saw on the map, but laid out in a way that explains a bit more by country what we're talking about in terms of the area that's apt for coffee production, and also to show you a bit of the variation across different models. So I'm sure many of you last year saw Michael Sheridan's tremendous presentation on box and whisker diagrams, so I won't repeat that here. But basically what I would draw your attention to is the bars that you see, uh, the colored bars there, represent more or less the, the area of agreement around the models in terms of the effect of climate change on coffee production areas in different countries. You'll note that the vast majority of them are under zero, which means that there's an overall decline in the area that's apt for coffee production. And so this gives you an idea, more or less, of what we're facing. The whiskers part of the diagram just shows that there is variation. So what we have here are models of what we think is going to happen based on our best understanding of current climate change models and our best understanding of coffee, both of which have issues to be worked on. But none of this is written in stone. None of this is something that we should take as a fait accompli. This is something where we really have the opportunity to bend the trajectory or, uh, of what's, what's happening. So I want to just lay this out here and say this is, this is what we're looking at, but it doesn't have to be the future. Despite that, we know that some of the climate change effects and impacts that we expect to see going forward are already here and now. And so Han has mentioned some of them. I'll go through them quickly. But obviously, this is one of them. You know, coffee leaf rust. The most recent studies seem to indicate that coffee leaf rust is related to you know, changes in the difference between daytime and nighttime temperatures, right? So less difference in between daytime and nighttime temperatures seems to, to provide a better habitat, if you will, for, for coffee leaf rust. The same can be said for our friend, the uh, coffee borer beetle. And again, here, climate is becoming more favorable for the, the beetle and less favorable for those uh, of us who depend on coffee. And another piece of data here, just to show you, this is data from Tanzania showing that basically for every change in temperature, every centigrade change in temperature reduces yields by about 137 kilograms per hectare. So we're already beginning to see some of these changes. And I think the most important point that I want to make here is this is concerning to us, but perhaps even more so for the, the women and men in the coffee lands who are actually producing the coffee that we seek and that we buy and that we sell. 
and on which we base our livelihoods. So when we come to the level of the farmer, the lady standing in her coffee field at the end of a hard day of work, she's asking questions like, well, this year the rainfall has been more erratic. Is it going to be more erratic next year? You know, is it a better investment of my time to continue to tend my coffee plants, or should I be thinking about moving into cocoa production or maybe into avocados or, or maybe even leaving my farm? Should I be advising my children and my grandchildren to stay in farming, or should I be working as hard as I can to get as much income from my farm so they can start a new life in the city or in another country? So these are the kind of decisions that are running through people's heads that are at the base of our supply chain. If we can't find a way to begin to work with the, our partners and deal with some of these unknowns and some of these challenges, and particularly some of the risks that they're facing, it's very likely that the kinds of figures we're seeing coming out of Central America in terms of people leaving coffee, both producers as well as labor, will continue. And that's a challenge for all of us. Coffee can't produce and harvest itself. We need farmers and we need farm workers. So we need to understand how we can begin to get our heads around the uncertainty and the risk that's involved in climate change and find solutions that work. So that's where we are now. And just to continue on this uh, doom and gloom topic, we'll, we'll get to the nice part in a little while. You know, if we do nothing, what can we expect? You know, I think this is Aaron's presentation I think was very clear, but at a global level, we expect less area for coffee production and most likely lower production of Arabica. We can expect higher prices. We can expect probably lower quality. I think we've had clear exp explanations of where that's coming from. We can continue to see coffee migrating up hillsides, which in a context like Ethiopia or a context like Colombia or a context like Peru or Guatemala, is not a problem. You can migrate to a cer certain extent up the hillsides and you can continue to produce. But if you're in Nicaragua, as I talk to farmers, they say, well, our problem is we don't have a third floor on our house. We've got a second floor, but there's no third floor. So you begin to reach areas where really there is this, this migration up the hillsides and moving to escape the effects of climate is no longer possible. And then finally, I think we're going to see more robust stuff, for better or for worse. We can discuss that at some other point. Um, but that's probably going to be one of the, the reactions uh, that we will see in the long term based on what's happening now. So just to recapitulate some of the key messages about where we are and where we're going in terms of the, the climate change modeling. First off, we need to understand, and I think we've been fairly clear, climate change, maybe when you started talking about it you know, seven or eight years ago, was seen as something that was mid to long term. Well, the reality is it's here now. And it's affecting and impacting the regions we source from, and it's affecting and impacting the people that we work with and finally depend on for the coffee that we sell on a daily basis. However, climate change is not uniform. Climate change varies, and I think Aaron's presentation was very clear about this in the case of Ethiopia. It varies over space and time. So we can't come up, although it would be nice, with any one-size-fits-all solution or any magic bullet that's going to solve all of the issues of climate change. It's a complex issue. It's moving over a long time frame. It involves multiple actors. And it's something that we need to begin to take apart and make more actionable. I think one of the reasons why uh, perhaps climate change wasn't on the agenda or hasn't been recently on the agenda here at Symposium is because we see it as such a big, scary thing we don't know where to start. So I think one of, the, one of the key things we'll get into in a moment is how we can actually break it down into something actionable. And actionable means these tailor, the idea of tailored adaptation strategies. Not one size fits all, but strategies that respond to the specific needs of farmers and value chain actors in a specific geography over a specific amount of time. And when you begin to break it down to that, it's something that we can all begin to act on. And then the, I think this is perhaps the most heartening point on this slide is please keep in mind that these doom and gloom projections and things we're showing are based on business as usual. If we do nothing, this is what we can expect. So obviously the flip side of that is if we do something, we can avoid a lot of these, these effects. So the question then becomes, what do we need to do? So in terms of what can be done, SEAD has been working for many years on this idea of coffee and climate. Uh, and we've been lucky enough uh, recently to begin to work with a lot of partners. So we've had uh, the support from, from USAID to begin to work with partners like uh, the Sustainable Food Lab, Root Capital, 
uh, Hans Neumann Foundation, Conservation International, uh, and a range of other partners to begin to identify specific ways that we can take these scary maps, if you will, of climate change and turn them into something that's actionable. So I guess my message to you here is we are beginning this work. There's a lot of space and scope for collaboration, and we would certainly welcome uh, any of you who would be interested in having a, a deeper conversation about this. So what we can do is begin to break down the scary maps into something that's actionable. The first thing is keep calm, don't freak out. Okay, it, this is the normal reaction when I put these maps up is people want to run out of the room, their hair starts to light on fire, they, you know. Don't do that, please. The first thing we need to do is, is keep calm and begin to think about what we can act on. The first thing we think is important is to understand where you are. As Aaron showed really clearly, not everywhere is going to be affected by climate change at the same time and in the same way. So the first thing we need to understand is where you are in the geography and in space and time as it relates to climate change. In the case of Central America, we can go through the same kind of exercise that, uh, that Aaron did for Ethiopia. We can project 2050 and we can project the areas that are going to change. But then we need to understand over that overlay, where are we? Where are we sourcing? Where are we engaged? Where are our partners and where can we act? So as we get into that, there are certain terms that we use. And the three simplest ways perhaps of grouping these areas is between coping, areas, adjustment areas, and transformation areas. Areas that can cope with climate change are areas that have the potential to adapt and basically continue to produce coffee through 2050 with relatively modest investments. Areas that need to adjust are areas that really are going to need to make more significant investments but can also continue to produce coffee through 2050. And those areas that are in transformation are areas where it's going to become increasingly difficult to maintain coffee production and therefore we're thinking about people's livelihoods shifting from coffee-based livelihoods to other livelihoods. So prior to getting into the details of some of that for, for Central America, there are also some basic Hippocratic principles here. You know, do no harm. Some basic things that we should be promoting regardless of where we are on the cope, adapt, cope, adapt and transform framework are things like at the farm level, uh, soil health, good water management, good agricultural practices, None of this is rocket science. We know more or less what needs to be done, but we aren't doing it effectively. At the level of producer organizations, how do you strengthen producer organizations to be able to deal with climate risk, but also the price risk inherent in working in a, in a market-based system? And when you go to a higher level, how do we strengthen institutions in producing countries so that they're more effective? I think the, the stark difference between Central America reaction to rust and what happened in Colombia is very clear. In one case, you have a stronger institution that was able to deal with climate, you know, with, with rust, and in others, you have much weaker institutions. So some of these principles I would consider to be do no harm and that should be done everywhere. And if we get into the specific details, the best way to do this is to ground truth the information. So the mapping and the modeling exercises are inputs. They're not written in stone they're our best understanding of what we think is going to happen, but they need to be tested and evaluated with people in your value chain. So you need to, you need to sit down with the people you work with, farmers, producer organizations, exporters, technical service providers, input providers, the government, et cetera, in these different areas of the impact gradient and begin to decide what needs to be done. It needs to be ground truth and it needs to be based on their needs. And with these groups, we need to identify and prioritize what are the most relevant practices in this context? What are the costs and what are the benefits? And it's very important on the costs and benefits because we tend to think that the changes that are needed for climate smart adaptation or climate smart agriculture should be borne by farmers. In many cases, the farmers are the least able members of our value chain to make these investments. So how can we begin to get a better understanding of what the true costs are and also what the true benefits are? If we can maintain a producing region over a much longer time frame, we're gonna, the, a lot of those benefits are going to accrue to the commercial actors in the chain. So shouldn't we be putting up some money? Shouldn't we be putting up some effort to help our farmers adapt? So if we go through some of the things on the coping, again, this is the easiest one. None of these practices are new, but these are the kind of things we would be talking about promoting in areas that are coping. In areas that they're adjusting, you've got 
new varieties coming in. So this is where the world coffee research, for example, work fits in very nicely. And we need to begin to understand here how do we cover these costs because these are more significant. And as we move into the transformation zones, it becomes more challenging. These are zones that may not in the future be coffee zones. Do we have a role to play there? Do we have any kind of moral obligation to do anything? I can't answer that question for you. I think it's a question that we should discuss. But these are the areas that are going to move into cocoa or move into avocado. And maybe we buy cocoa and avocado as well. And we can construct investment portfolios. And we can look for different investors to help fund this work. You know, and then there are different entry points for, the, for action. So we can act from our company perspective in our value chain. We can say, OK, I want to overlay my sourcing region with the, the climate gradient. And I want to identify where I need to adjust in coping and adjust, adjustment and where there may be transformation. So I can do that from my perspective as a company. Or I can come into a coalition with other companies, which I think is potentially more powerful, and work together around a, around a specific region as a sector. So things like the, the, uh, the CCC work in Nicaragua is a good example of this. And in some cases, we may want to partner with companies that aren't even in the coffee chain, but might actually be potential buyers for cocoa and other crops in a geography that's under transformation. The other thing to think about is where is funding coming from? I think it's entirely reasonable to put the onus on funding in areas of coping on the coffee sector. These are regions where investments that we make will generate, most likely, a positive return and will allow us to recover our investments over a reasonable time frame. In areas where we're talking about adjustment, we're most likely talking about public-private partnerships. Uh, where we're going to need to harness both industry investment but also public sector. And in areas of transformation, it's probably more of a public sector play. Yeah? There's a global public good about helping people transition and not have huge dislocation, and I think that's probably a role more for the, private, for the public sector. The private sector role there is more in, in building or adapting existing supply chains to new crops. So in the case of Nicaragua, can we transition coffee co-ops to be cocoa co-ops? Yeah? Those are the kind of things. There are a few key messages I want to leave you with. First off, and I think Aaron was clear about this as well, we can do things, but we need to start acting now. The last thing we want to do is, again, get terrified by these maps, run out of the room with our hair on fire, and stick our heads in the sand. That's the last thing we want to do. So we need to start thinking collectively and using the innovation and the capacity to be creative that's in this room to think about how we can begin to act now to minimize the most grave impacts over time. Secondly, and this is really important, we need to find ways to combine what we can learn from science with the ground truthing that we can learn from less formal science, if you will, with producers and other actors in your value chains with the right incentives. Price incentives, support incentives, all kinds of incentives that can come from the business sector are really critical. We need to align them, and we need to make them consistent over time so that farmers can deal with climate change in ways that do not increase their risk. And finally, we need to double down on partnerships. This is not an issue that any one person or one organization or one company or one government can solve. This is an issue that requires collaboration. It's an issue that requires creativity. And it's an issue that requires a very long time frame. So we need to learn to work together more effectively. And so finally, just coming back to Marianita, if we hope that Marianita is in our supply chain tomorrow, and that maybe even her kids, or hopefully even her grandkids, can continue to sell coffee to whatever giant coffee conglomerate exists at that point, you know, this is what we have to start working on. Climate change is here. It's happening now. But there are things we can do about it. The scary part of climate change is not acting. If we can begin to act in a co collaborative and a coordinated fashion, we can get in front of this. And there is a potential to really drive a much more resilient coffee system that provides not only livelihoods for Marianita and her family, but for everyone else who's active along the value chain. And so my invitation to all of you is to begin to think about where you can provide support. What can you do from your perspective, from your place in the value chain? And how can we come together to be more effective? Because finally, the future of coffee depends on all of us working together. Thank you.